it's time for Northwestern Outdoors Radio, the award-winning show that covers fishing, hunting, and all sorts of outdoor recreation here in the great Northwest. Northwestern Outdoors is brought to you every week by Max Lure Company, a legacy of innovation since 1969, by Loophole Optics, America's optical authority, by Camp Chef, the way to cook outdoors, by Wallawa County, nature is on display in Northeast Oregon, and by The Real News, your fishing resource. Also by Shiloh Inns and Suites, providing you with affordable excellence. And by Mardon Resort, the place for fishing, hunting, and more in eastern Washington. And now, it's time to head outside with your host, John Cruz. Labor Day has come and gone. The campgrounds, beaches, and woods are emptying, and it is truly the perfect time of year to get outside and enjoy your favorite outdoors passion with out all of the summer crowds. Two big things that happen this month in the Northwest are fishing and hunting, and we have a great show for you that focuses on both pursuits. We start off by talking with Dennis Dobble. He's a retired fisheries biologist and outdoors writer from the Tri-Cities who tells us about two of his recent books and weighs in on why we are seeing such great salmon runs up the Columbia and Snake Rivers and whether lawsuits by the Wild Fish Conservancy are helping or herding fish and fish recovery here in the Northwest. Lance Mers joins us for an extended Max Minute to talk about a lure that will catch salmon, halibut, and bottom fish in the salt water. And then we get to talk hunting with Dale Denny, owner of Bear Paw Outfitters. Dale offers guided hunts in Montana, Idaho, and Washington, and has a pre-season big game hunting preview for you with a little fall turkey info thrown in for good measure. We've got some really interesting outdoor news for you this week to include thoughts about the possible reintroduction of grizzly bears by the federal government into Washington's Cascade Mountains, some troublesome bears in western Montana, news about deer poachers busting in Oregon, and a shout out to a couple of guys in Idaho working hard to help out sage grouse and other wildlife species. In addition to outdoor news, we've got fresh salmon fishing reports from the mouth of the Columbia River, a trout fishing report from Montana's Big Hole River, and some hunting info out of Idaho you're going to want to know about. Throw in upcoming events featuring youth pheasant hunts, several equine events around the Northwest, some fairs as well, and we've got a whole bunch of outdoors fun coming your way. But before we go any further, we've got a really unique edition of Sportsman Spotlight for you this week, brought to you by Shiloh Inn & Suites, the chain that lives up to its motto of affordable excellence. This week, David Sparks asks the question every outdoors enthusiast has to ask themselves at some point, what's going to be on my tombstone? Let's listen in to find out more. Sportsman's Headstone, David Sparks, Sportsman Spotlight. I better clear that headline up. I ran into Danny Porter, owner of Memorial Monuments, at a sportsman's show recently, and he has a product for very avid outdoorsmen. As I strolled by, I see these magnificent stone pieces with an elk, with a salmon, with the mountains in the background, geese. And I understand that you make all kinds of monuments, including for graveyards. Absolutely. We do boulders, we do headstones, we do address rocks. Uh, whatever you can think of, we do it. Benches, anything out of rock or granite, we can do it. Okay, so, but let's get to this. Uh, have you ever had anybody come in and say, you know, my husband was an absolutely obsessed elk hunter and I'd like to have you do a rest in peace? You bet. All the time. In fact, we'll put elk on people's headstones and all kinds of sayings and different things. And so they come in to your shop mm -hmm. and say, here's what I would like. And who does the stone carving? I mean, tell me about that process. Uh, we do everything in-house. So we bring our granite in, and then we do all the carving, all the design work. We do all that in-house, and everything's customizable. We have an artist on hand. If somebody brings in something custom, we can get it drawn up and done specifically for them. And we've also got a huge selection of artwork that people can choose from to use that we already have. This is David Sparks for Sportsman Spotlight. Confused by so many national brand hotel reward programs, blackout dates, expiration dates, different points for different hotel rewards and gimmicks. At Shiloh Inn Suites Hotels, it's simple. No blackout dates for any rewards stay. If we have a room available, it's yours. Hi, I'm Mark Hemstreet, owner of Shiloh Inns. As a rewards member, you'll receive free room upgrades, a dedicated personal agent to help book your stay, points that don't expire, 
points that can be used for free nights at any one of our beautiful hotels or donations to your local school or free airline tickets, and much more. And as a special bonus, you'll earn 100 free bonus points just for signing up. From your very first stay, you receive free Wi-Fi, free breakfast at most locations. The kids stay free. We don't charge ridiculous resort or parking fees. And we're dog-friendly. Shiloh Inns, affordable excellence. American-owned and proud of it. Good hunters know before you take that shot, you've got to see the whole picture. Now, the best way to do that is with a spotting scope, binoculars, or a rifle scope, but it's got to be from Leupold. Now, Leupold is a Northwest company with a reputation that stretches across the world for making superior optics. Look for Leupold Optics at your local Cabela's store, Dick's Sporting Goods, or online at Leupold.com. Leupold, America's optical authority. Yeah, you, the guide, outfitter, or outdoor business owner who's listening to Northwestern Outdoors Radio. Have you ever thought of becoming a sponsor of our show? We've got local sponsor opportunities at all 50 of the stations. They carry Northwestern Outdoors every week, and we've got some network opportunities too. If the outdoors is your business, we can help you with your advertising needs. Contact me, John Cruz, through our website at northwesternoutdoors.com. That's northwesternoutdoors.com, helping you get the word out about your outdoors company. He said we're right on him. Without missing a beat, you'll drop your line down to 42 feet. If you don't screw up, it won't be long. Someone in this boat's gonna sing Fish On. Fish On! Fish On! Next on Northwestern Outdoors Radio, we're talking fish. We're talking fishing with Dennis Dauble. He's a scientist, an author, and an educator with a couple of books to his name to include Fishes of the Columbia Basin. Dennis, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and about this book that you've written. Sure, John. Well, I retired in 2009 after working uh, approximately 35 years for Pacific Northwest National Lab in Richland. Most of my time on salmon issues in the Columbia and Snake Rivers, although I was lucky enough to spend the early part of my career studying uh, life history and ecology of over 40 species of fish that live in the Hanford Reach. Wow. Uh, right now, I'm a adjunct professor at the WSU Branch Campus in Richland, where I teach a course in fish biology each spring. And I was also recently selected to be on Humanities Washington Speakers Bureau. And that will involve presentations to the general public on the consequences of dam removal. Well, I've really enjoyed this book because, folks, it basically covers, what, about 60-plus different species of fish that you find in the Columbia Basin. Everything from salmon to bluegill to lamprey, I mean, you name it, if it swims in the Columbia Basin, uh, you pretty much cover its life history, where it's found, and, and even some tips on how to catch these fish, too, don't you? Yeah, I was, in terms of the book, it, it came out right after I was retired which was good. I had a goal to write a book for the general public about fishes. And like I told my publisher, Kiyoki Books, seems like everybody's got books on birds or plants and mushrooms, but there wasn't anything out there about fishes unless you were a professional with $75 in your pocket. So my goal is to write a $15 book that people would keep in their tackle box or beside their bed. I think you did a great job on it. Again, that's Fishes of the Columbia Basin, folks. We're going to tell you where to buy that in a couple of minutes. But first, First, let's talk a little about salmon and steelhead. I mean, we had a really tough decade in the 1990s and the, the earlier part of the 2000s when it came to salmon and steelhead returns up the Columbia and Snake Rivers. But now it seems like the good old days are back. We've been having these really abundant runs of both Chinook and Coho salmon. Uh, what's going on here? Well, I hate to wax poetic this early in our discussion, but I like to think of my philosophy professor used to say it's all of the above. In other words, there's a lot of things going on that affect salmon populations. Sure. The past few decades have led to some major improvements in fish passage at the dams. Mm -hmm. There's been changes in flow management practices and then also uh, increased awareness over the what the impacts of harvest and hatcheries have done to those populations. Those things are largely under our control, and I believe we're getting smarter. So let me ask you a kind of a follow-up question here. You know, the, the Chinook and salmon runs are just fantastic going up the Columbia and Snake Rivers the last couple of years, but in Puget Sound, 
in, in the Puget Sound area rivers, uh, the runs are not doing that well at all. What's the difference? Well, there's differences, of course, in terms of uh, hatcheries. No matter what, we are still very highly dependent on hatcheries in terms of having fish that we can harvest True. as sport anglers. True. I think the, the situation there is degraded habitat, both from encroachment by you know human development. They don't have the flow management issues that we have, but they've certainly got a, a lot more uh, population and, and other things going on in terms of land use activities. Uh, the Green River being a really good example of that. Yeah, I mean, you if you spend any time over there, you you get a feeling for what you know human encroachment does. And you know we're we're so lucky over here in in eastern Washington and northeastern Oregon area, just in terms of how much open ground we have. Let me ask you another question. This is getting back to salmon, but a different species this time, sockeye salmon. The last two years have been absolutely incredible in terms of the numbers of sockeye that have gone up the Columbia River to places like Lake Wenatchee and Lake Osoyoos. What are your thoughts about this? Why is this going on? Well, my first thoughts are great. I love it. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a really an exciting summer fishery, and it fills in the time between springers and fall chinook salmon. I fished Lake Wenatchee for the first time last year, and this year I managed to catch a few sockeye out of the Hanford Reach, which you go back a few years and it, that fishery didn't even exist. Right. Things were crazy at Brewster in July. Uh, I got there just a little bit late after that break in the weather, and by then most of the fish had headed for Canada, but that's turned out to be a tremendous uh, fishery as well. I think much of the credit for increased numbers really goes to the collaborative enhancement efforts that are going on now between uh, British Columbia's Okanagan Nation Alliance and the Colville Confederated Tribes. Right. So if you look at where that rearing habitat is, and of course uh, sockeye need lakes to complete their life history, that is largely in Canada. So we need need the help of our Canadian friends on this. But those combined efforts have led to a number of things. We increase hatchery releases, improve juvenile rearing habitat, and also protective flows. And all those things together have just really, really paid off, I think. Well, it, it certainly is a great time to be a salmon angler east of the Cascades right now, that's for sure. And, and a lot of anglers on the lower Columbia are having great year as well. Folks, you're listening to Northwestern Outdoors Radio. We're talking to Dennis Dobble. He's the author of Fishes of the Columbia Basin. And another book we're going to talk about in a minute, The Barbless Hook. But before we get there, let me ask you a question about, well, some controversy that's been going on lately regarding hatchery production for both steelhead and salmon. There's a group called the Wild Fish Conservancy. They filed a lawsuit successfully against the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife that really curtailed steelhead smolt releases in Puget Sound. They've now filed a notice of intent to sue the Leavenworth National Hatchery in eastern Washington about their hatchery operations for Spring Chinook, which has traditionally provided a very strong fishery for anglers for for decades. Is this group on the right track, and, and are there actions good for the sport of fishing or not so good for sport anglers? Sounds like you saved the zinger for the last question here. Yeah, I looked at the Wild Fish Conservancy's website, and it's hard to argue with their goals. And, and I'll quote that, to support the conservation and recovery of wild fish ecosystems. The challenge for fish managers, though, however, is that some of these watersheds are sufficiently degraded that they no longer have the capacity to support harvest. And for most anglers, as well as for treaty tribes, harvest is central to their interest in salmon and steelhead. And hatchery fish provide this angling opportunity or harvest opportunity. But there are situations and uh, where hatchery programs have continued to operate at the expense of ecosystem recovery and protection. And so I think while groups like the Wild Fish Conservancy may aggravate some, uh, they also help keep things honest. Well, there you go. We could spend a lot more time on this topic, but we're running out of time. And before we go, I want to go ahead and give our listeners a quick tease about your new book, the Barbless Hook. Tell our listeners a little bit about this. Well, the, the subtitle of The Barbless Hook is Inner Sanctum of Angling Revealed, and that pretty much says it. The stories are not about how to or where to catch fish. 
rather what goes on the side of your head when you're fishing or thinking about fishing. And some of the examples that I took, and these are all true stories I think every angler can relate to, are things like having to take turns at a guided trip. Oh, yes. Which is never a good thing. I was um, actually just reading that before we went on the air, and it, it rang very true. <laughs> Go on. Yeah, it hurts me every time I even think about it. Um <laughs> Now, what happens if your buddy breaks your favorite rod or knocks a salmon off your net? So, you know, what do you say and, and what you think are going to be two different things? I talk about some other controversial topics like how secret is your secret fishing hole, when you might want to fish alone, and then also one of my favorites was whether astrology can help you find a compatible fishing buddy. <laughs> Well, there you go, folks. That's The Barbless Hook, the other book, Fishes of the Columbia Basin. You can go to Amazon.com or go to the publisher's website at KeokeeBooks.com. That's K-E-O-K-E-E Books.com, KeokeeBooks.com. And you can find out more about Dennis and what he's up to at his website, Dennis Dobble, D-A-U-B-L-E. That's Dennis Dobble.com. Dennis, thanks for taking the time to be with us today on Northwestern Outdoors Radio. Thanks, John. That's the sound you hear when a fish hits the new Sonic bait fish from Max Lure Company. This metal lure can be cast, trolled, or jigged, and will catch just about anything that swims in the sea, the river, or the lake. The Sonic bait fish has a unique vibration and flutter that can be rigged in seven different ways. With all sorts of eye-catching colors and weights available, you'll be reaching for the Sonic bait fish as your go-to lure. It's the Sonic bait fish. Only from Max Lure Company. We're back with John Cruz on Northwestern Outdoors Radio. It's time for another Max Minute. Fish on! Brought to you every week by Max Lure Company. This week, we're going to tell you about a lure you can use in the salt water, well, pretty much year-round. You can use it in the summer and fall to catch Chinook and coho salmon off the coast or in the sound. In the winter months, you can use it to catch blackmouth in Puget Sound as well. And in the spring, this lure also works great for halibut all up and down the northwest coastline. It's the cha-cha salmon from Max Lure. With us here to tell us more about it, Lance Mertz with Max Lure Company. What is this? lure all about john this lure is all about catching salmon Any and type, halibut apparently too and halibut <laughs> yes that's the the beauty of this lure it's so versatile that you can use it with or without bait it comes with a three and four aught hook and a 2.8 inch smile blade and because it's so offset it, it gives you extreme action in the water and the other thing about these squid bodies is that they're all high uv and glow what we have here today that I'm holding in my hand is a big pink smile blade, a couple of beads, a four inch hoochie. You got your leader up top, you got your big stout hooks on the bottom, both red, and fish do seem to love those red hooks. It looks like it'll work great. Yep. It is. And, you know, if, if you really wanted to, you could tip that bait with some tuna and go to the straight to the bottom, and it does great for bottom fish as well. Well, there you go. The lure you need for just about anything you want to catch out of the sea, it's the Cha Cha Salmon from Max Lure Company. Look for it at your local sporting goods store or at maxlure.com. And that wraps up another Max Minute from Max Lure Company. I'm Bob Loomis and I fish for walleye. Sometimes when I'm out on the water I feel like a destroyer captain hunting for targets with my electronics. I'm not hunting submarines though, I'm hunting fish. And when I find that big one on the fish finder, I want to make sure she's going to bite. That's where the Smile Blade Slow Death Rig from Max Lure comes in. The Smile Blade spins and flashes at ultra slow speeds and the one of a kind red hook keeps that bait moving in a way the fish can't resist. It's the Smile Blade Slow Death Rig. You're the destroyer, this is your depth charge. Only from Max Lure. It's a great time to go fishing, and whether you're heading to the lake for trout, to the salt water for salmon, or fishing the Columbia for Chinook or Steelhead, The Real News has got you covered. The columnists at The Real News are just like you, die-hard anglers. Better still, they share their expertise to help you have a great time on the water. The Real News has been going strong for 26 years and prides itself on being Washington's only sport fishing newspaper. Look for your copy at local sporting goods retailers or subscribe online at therealnews.com. 
the road is calling you to experience one of Oregon's seven wonders, the Wallawas. So grab your hiking boots and camera and capture the beauty and grandeur of Northeast Oregon's Wallawa County. Experience nature like never before when you saddle up and ride into the Eagle Cap Wilderness, hike the trails of the Wallawas, hear the wind rush through the bunch grass and view the wildlife of the Zumwalt Prairie, or ride the churning waters of the wild and scenic Wallawa, Snake, and Grand Ronde Rivers. This summer, take the road that leads to wonders. It begins at WallawaCountyChamber.com. More habitat equals more wildlife. Pheasants Forever is working hard every day to ensure there's more wildlife habitat for the future. Join the Habitat Leader and help create wildlife habitat in your community. To join us, go to pheasantsforever.org. Guy, you keep on talking just like every year. And you're heading up north to test your hunting luck. Your truck's all loaded with blaze orange and beer. So get up there and I hope you get your buck. I hope I get a buck. I hope I get a buck. Welcome back to Northwestern Outdoors Radio. If it's September, it's time to think about big game hunting in the Northwest. And here to give us a preview of the season ahead is longtime outfitter and guide Dale Denny, the owner of Bear Paw Outfitters out of Colville, Washington. Dale, you guide in Washington, Idaho, and Montana. And I thought we'd take some time to break down your views on what the season ahead is going to look like for hunters. Welcome back to the show. Good morning, John. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. And I love love this time of year and, and I love the prospect of going out in the field and hunting again. So let's go ahead and start off in big sky country. Now, license sales are down for non-residents, but that doesn't mean the deer and elk hunting is bad, does it? No, they've, they've had a, a drop in sales for a few years now. And, you know, most people believe it's due to the initiative that was passed because there, there used to be non-resident licenses available over the counter. Right. And there no longer is there a draw now. And so that's that's the common thought is that that was the primary reason that coupled with the economy, of course. Sure. So how are things looking in Big Sky Country for both deer and elk, just generally speaking? You think it's going to be a good year? If you hunt the right places, I think it will be good. You know, elk numbers are, are at a high in Montana. In the east side, they're probably not as strong in the west side because there's areas that have been impacted by wolves. But eastern Montana, the herds are, are bigger than they really want them to be. The problem that hunters face is, is getting on private property there. But if you can get on private property, there's some excellent hunting in eastern Montana. You know, it, it's funny you mentioned that. There's actually companies now, folks, that make digital maps that show you what the public-private boundaries are and even will show you who the private property owner is. So now's the time to start digging into that and maybe start knocking on some doors and bringing some smoked salmon in hand or something else from the Northwest if you want to get permission. We use those applications, John. They're good. Okay, there you go. Uh, Dale, another question for you. You know, we talked elk there. What about deer? I've, I've always thought deer are prolific in Montana, and I'm guessing that should equate to some really good hunting this year. You know, there's there's a few things that have occurred in Montana in the previous few years, and, and the population isn't as strong as it was, say, six years ago. There was some blue tongue, and then there were some hard winters, and, you know, it took a bit of a toll on, on the deer and on the antelope. It didn't seem to affect the elk so much. The herds aren't as large as they were, but there's still probably more deer than anywhere else that you can go hunting, and... You know, my experience is Montana is just about as good as it gets for deer hunting. And and they're still good herds. They're just not quite as many as there was. All right. Let's turn our attention to the gem state. When it comes to Idaho, in terms of elk and deer, uh, what do you expect this year? Again, elk, elk are strong in a lot of the state. The areas that have impacted by wolves, you know, a hunter's not going to find quite as many elk there. And so you need to, you need to be careful where you decide that you want to hunt and and you just need to plan more more thoroughly than in the past because even in the wolf areas you can still be successful and the great thing about idaho is over-the-counter tags and lots of public ground that is a, a great thing indeed tell me a little bit about deer hunting in idaho everyone always thinks elk when they think idaho but but how is it deer hunting there Actually, Idaho is very well known for its mule deer hunting, too. Uh, it produces some really large bucks. And Idaho actually has really good whitetail hunting. We don't do the whitetail. We just hunt mule deer in southern Idaho. But Idaho has really good deer hunting, and a lot of people don't really realize that. 
So, turning our attention to Washington State. Now, I know there's a very healthy population of white-tailed deer in northeast Washington where you live. And there's a lot of mule deer in the state east of the Cascades. But there's also been a lot of wildfire this summer. How do you think that's going to affect hunting this season? You know, it's, it's hard to say for positive yet. Uh, there's been some rains, and we might get some young forage coming up in, in some of those fire areas that will help the deer. If grass and stuff doesn't get going, the deer are probably not going to be in those open areas as much, and so they're going to concentrate on them areas with more cover. You know, And we don't know how many deer were lost in the fire. Undoubtedly, there were some, but I, I think there was a lot of big game that escaped the fire. And if a guy hunts the areas with cover surrounding the fire there's probably going to be some good hunting. Uh, however, it, there may be some pretty good crowds, too. So it's just one of those things we're going to have to see how it plays out. Fair enough. Folks, you're listening to Northwestern Outdoors Radio. We're talking to Dale Denny, owner of Bear Paw Outfitters. He's giving us a hunting preview for the states of Idaho, Montana, and Washington because he guides in all three of those states, he and his assistant guides. Let's go ahead and, and change gears a little bit from big game to turkey. Everyone always thinks about turkey hunting in the spring, but there's some really good fall turkey hunting as well in northeast Washington, isn't there? There is, and really all a person has to do is change up their tactics a little bit, and and the fall turkey hunt is really a great hunt. It's not quite as much fun because you're not calling in gobblers and and you don't get that kind of excitement, but uh, there's still some really great hunting, and there's a lot of different methods to hunt fall turkeys and uh, if a guy just does a little bit of reading up on it, you can you can be successful, and it's a really fun hunt. Now, Stevens County and, and Ferry County, and basically northeast Washington is probably ground zero in terms of the best place to hunt, but the Blue Mountains offer some pretty good turkey hunting too, don't they? It does, and, and you know, birds are spreading across the state slowly, and they're getting them over on the, on the east slope of the Cascades pretty regular now. Uh, however, the northeast corner of the state still is producing, you know, probably three-quarters of the state's birds. All right, folks, so there you go. Looks like it's going to be an interesting year for hunting, whether you're after turkey or big game. Let's go ahead and talk about something else, Dale. You've been serving on an outdoor recreation task force uh, for the state of Washington. What is this all about? What have you been up to there? Well, Governor Inslee appointed a task force to look into ways to improve recreational opportunities and recreational business in Washington. And so the task force, is, uh, they've met uh, about six times around the state, different areas. They've taken public testimony. There's been a website, uh, Engage Outdoor Washington, uh, that's been online for people to go on and comment. And so it's really been a, a fact and data gathering endeavor and we've discussed different issues, and, and we're putting together a, a draft right now to recommend to the governor on actions to take to try to improve recreational opportunities in Washington. What are some of the big concerns or other topics that you're hearing from the public as you go to these different meetings around the state? I think that, and, and I can't speak for the task force, but what I seem to hear, there was probably more concern about the Discover Pass and access to property than any any other issues. Is this by people who don't want to pay for the Discover Pass? Because uh, as you and I know, as hunters and and fishermen, we're used to paying the freight and, you know, our our license fees are our user fees. Is that what you're hearing is just people don't like these user fees in terms of the Discover Pass? I think think there's two schools of thought. There's the people that don't like it. They feel like they should be able to go on public land without being charged. And then there's the people that can't afford it. You know, there's there's a lot of people out there working for minimum wage. Right. They even have a family that they're trying to support on minimum wage. By the time they buy groceries, pay their rent, they don't have thirty dollars to buy a Discover Pass. And so, one of the concerns has been that perhaps that's an impediment to getting people outdoors. And and so we're trying to put together some recommendations to better ways to deal with that, and possibly some other funding sources. Like I said, it's a draft at this point, so. I'm not sure how it'll end up, you know what I mean? Well, I'm looking forward to reading it. What is the website again so people can check that out? It's Engage Outdoor Washington. All right, that's EngageOutdoorWashington.com, I presume? Yes. Okay, EngageOutdoorWashington.com to find out what the Outdoor Recreation Task Force is doing in Washington State. And if you want to find out about hunting with Dale Denny and Bear Paw Outfitters, they've got a website, and again, they cover three states. It's Bear Paw 
bearpawoutfitters.com. Really easy to remember, bearpawoutfitters.com. Taking you big game hunting and turkey hunting too here in the Northwest, bearpawoutfitters.com. Dale, thanks as always for being on the show. Always enjoy talking with you. It's been a pleasure. I hope I get this box. Good hunters know before you take that shot, you've got to see the whole picture. Now, the best way to do that is with a spotting scope, binoculars, or a rifle scope, but it's got to be from Leupold. Now, Leupold is a Northwest company with a reputation that stretches across the world for making superior optics. Look for Leupold Optics at your local Cabela's store, Dick's Sporting Goods, or online at Leupold.com. Leupold, America's optical authority. Wetlands are some of the most important ecosystems on Earth, but our wetlands are quickly disappearing. Find out how you can help. Join Ducks Unlimited today. Welcome back to Northwestern Outdoors Radio. It's time again for news and reports from the field, brought to you every week by Mardon Resort at Eastern Washington's Potholes Reservoir. Two events that we need to tell you about coming up really quick. First is the one fishing tournament you don't need a boat for. It's the Mardon Dock Tournament. It's taking place from Friday, September 12th through Sunday, September 14th. And you can basically pay your entry fee and then catch different species of fish. The biggest fish of all the different species you can find in Potholes Reservoir all will get you money. It's a whole lot of fun. There's usually over a hundred anglers that are fishing this tournament. And believe it or not, there's room for plenty more. The dock system is just that big. If you have a boat, then come on over on Sunday the 14th and join me for the Old Farts Bass Tournament. Now, one person in your party has to be north of 40, but the other one can be a young one and do all the grunt work for you while you're having fun fishing. That's the Old Farts Bass Tournament and the Mardon Dock Tournament taking place the weekend of the 12th through the 14th at Mardon Resort. Find out more at MardonResort.com. MardonResort.com, where the fish bite, but we don't. We start off our news by asking the question, is the federal government going to reintroduce grizzly bears to Washington State? Well, they're thinking about it. That's the word from multiple media outlets reporting the National Park Service is launching a three-year process to determine whether the big bears should be brought back to the North Cascades in central Washington, an area they once roamed but where few, if any, remain today. National Park Service Director Jonathan Jarvis said although no decision has been made to reintroduce grizzly bears, the process will involve developing an environmental impact statement, evaluating a variety of options for the future of the grizzly bear in this area. Not everybody is happy about the potential return of the big Bruins to include local government officials in one of the counties these big bears may end up calling home. Steve Hare, News director for our flagship station, 560 KPQ in Wenatchee, asked Chelan County Commissioner Keith Gaynor what he thought about this proposed reintroduction. Well, we're kind of, uh, I am anyway, I'm kind of curious as to why, you know, they are actually proposing the program. I and mean, we have wilderness up there. It seems like uh, we should just let the, the animals come and go as, as they, they are in the wilderness rather than introducing new things. If it's going to be you know, not managed necessarily by uh, influences of man, and I'm not sure that the grizzly bear uh, recovery program is, is really the way to, to pursue that. Chelan County Commissioner Doug England was also not in favor of this potential reintroduction for different reasons. One of our concerns is with black bears is the healthy population there. They're much easier to predict. Uh, their actions are easier to predict. And uh, once you are around them, you kind of know how to protect yourselves. The problem with grizzly bear is we're part of their food chain, and they can be very unpredictable. And uh, in essence, when you have grizzly bear in an area, uh, that cuts off all access uh, to people being even around them at all. So there you go. The lines are already being drawn when it comes to this issue, and we've got a long way to go before this story is over. We'll keep you updated 
as it unfolds. Speaking of grizzly bears, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks are dealing with some stubborn ones along the Flathead River near Columbia Falls. Fish and game personnel had to recapture a six-year-old female grizz and her two cubs on August 22nd. These same bears were captured earlier this year by biologists on the Flathead Indian Reservation to move them from nearby homes before any conflicts occurred. The bears were released on the east side of Hungry Horse Reservoir, but within several weeks, those bears swam the reservoir, crossed over the top of the Swan Mountains, and came back into the Flathead Valley, where they were poised to cause problems again. There's no word at this time where the bears are going to be released next, but presumably, it's going to be even further away from the Flathead Valley this time around. In Oregon, state police officials announced five people are facing charges regarding the poaching of a mule deer near Pendleton. On August 24th, a state police fish and wildlife trooper contacted five people in a vehicle and saw they had the head of a freshly killed buck mule deer with them. 23-year-old Vance Wright from Canyon City was the man who allegedly killed the deer out of season and not only received several citations, but also had the rifle he used to kill the deer seized. Three other young men and an adult woman from Pendleton were were cited for possessing the deer which was taken in an unlawful manner. The five will soon get a chance to tell their side of the story to a judge in court. We have happier news out of Idaho where we congratulate Ken Miracle out of Boise. He's been named one of the six finalists for the 2014 Heroes of Conservation Award hosted by Field and Stream magazine. Miracle volunteers his time and labor to benefit sage grouse in the Gem State. In addition to manual work to improve sage grouse habitat, he also contributes photographs and leads tours to educate people about this impressive upland bird, which is in decline through most of the American West. Field and Stream is going to announce their big winner on September 17th. We're rooting for you, Ken. Another man doing good work for sage grouse in central Idaho is Tom Page. Tom has a wrench next to the Possimoroi River that just happens to be perfect sage grouse habitat. Tom signed on to an all lands management approach with the sage grouse initiative to work his land in a way that benefits both his cattle as well as sage grouse, elk, mule deer, antelope, and nesting curlews. Installing wildlife friendly fences with markers to avoid bird fence collisions is just one of the things Page did on his Big Crick Ranch. You can find out more about what Ken, Tom, and others are doing to help out sage grouse by going to sagegrouseinitiative.com. That's sagegrouse grouseinitiative.com. Turning to field reports, the fishing has been good the last few weeks at the famous Buoy 10 salmon fishery at the mouth of the Columbia River. Jason Schultz, owner of Hell's Canyon Sport Fishing, says the big river is full of fish and a good mix of kings and silvers can be caught now if you can manage to be in the right spots at the right times. As for tactics, Jason hasn't been giving the traditional spinners much of a chance this season because herring has been working so well. Jason says either fresh bait herring or herring brine and Potsky fire brine are working equally well. Jason says some anglers are doing better than others, and what separates the two groups is patience. Jason says being patient and letting the fish swallow the bait before grabbing the rod is hard to do. But if you can give the fish a chance to eat a while before setting the hook, the odds of getting that fish in the boat are much greater. You can find out more about fishing with Jason on both the Columbia and Snake Rivers by going to his website at hellscanyonsportfishing.com. In southwest Montana, Chris with the Stonefly Fly Shop in Butte reports the Big Hole River has been providing consistent action for rainbows and browns, averaging 14 to 16 inches in size with some much bigger than that. Try casting trichos in the morning and hopper or beetle patterns in the afternoon. A big mayfly imitation in size 10 or 12 might work too. You can find out more about what's working on the Big Hole River and pick up some flies along the way at the Stonefly Fly Shop in Butte, which is open Mondays through Saturdays. In Idaho, this might be a good year to pick up an elk tag and maybe a deer tag too. The Idaho Fish and Game Commission has reduced prices for second deer and elk tags and Idaho hunters are taking advantage of the savings. As of August 25th, more than 500 hunters have purchased second deer tags and nearly 300 have purchased second elk tags. Idaho Fish and Game says these numbers are much higher than the past several years and this year's price reduction coincides with unusually high populations of deer in the state due to a series of mild winters. 
sounds like good hunting to me. In other news from the Gem State, dove season's going to last quite a while this year unless a cold snap sends the birds to warmer climes. The Idaho Fish and Game Commission has extended the dove hunting season to October 30th, a month longer than recent years, and the limit has been raised from 10 to 15 dove a day. If you've never spent a day in a dove field before, you are missing out. Because I'll tell you what, when the birds are flying, this is a whole lot of fun. Stay tuned. We're going to be coming back with some upcoming events, including a fishing derby, some youth pheasant hunting opportunities, and all sorts of things horse-related. We'll be right back with that and more on Northwestern Outdoors Radio. I'd like to tell you I just brought down that buck, (laughs) but I didn't. I missed. And you know why I missed? Because of the scope I've got on my rifle. You see, my friends told me to get a Leupold rifle scope. Why? Well, because Leupold is America's optical authority. They make a huge variety of quality scopes for every need, and they make them right here in the Northwest. Unfortunately, I didn't listen. I used the cheap scope that came with this rifle when I bought it. And when it came time to pull the trigger, well, let's just say things were a little blurry. Now, I've got nothing to look forward to except a long, empty-handed walk back home. Next time I come out into the field, there's going to be a loophole scope on my rifle. And next time, I'm not going to miss. Loophole rifle scopes. Check out the whole line at loophole.com and look for them at a sporting goods store near you. Looking for the ultimate cooking machine for your backyard or patio? Look no further than Camp Chef's new pellet grill and smoker. With user-friendly features like an auto ignition, digital readouts, and internal meat temperature sensors, it's easy to smoke the tastiest salmon, ribs, brisket, and turkey you'll ever eat. And an innovative system makes cleanup a snap. Everyone will want the food you're cooking on your Camp Chef pellet grill and smoker. The quality smoker that's second to none. Find out more at CampChef.com. Camp Chef, the way to cook outdoors. Hi, I'm Craig Boddington. I've written about hunting for 40 years, much of it in bear country. I trust my life to bear spray because the research is in. It stopped bears 92% of the time and prevented injury 98% of the time. Bear spray requires less accuracy and won't harm your companions or the bear. Carry bear spray in bear country. Keep it accessible and practice. From the Columbia River to Puget Sound, the Coastal Conservation Association in the Pacific Northwest works to conserve the fish we love and does so while protecting our heritage of sport fishing. To find out more, go to ccapnw.org. Again, that's ccapnw.org. We're back with one last cast from John Cruz on Northwestern Outdoors Radio. Let's run through some upcoming events before we go. The first one we want to tell you about is the Atomic Salmon Derby. It's taking place September 19th through the 21st on the Snake and Columbia Rivers near the Tri-Cities. You can pick up your tickets at Griggs and Pasco. This is always a fun derby. The catching should be really good this year, and the proceeds will be benefiting youth to get them fishing. Speaking of our youth, there are going to be some youth pheasant hunts taking place in Oregon and Idaho over the next 30 days. Now, in Oregon, they'll be taking place at wildlife areas throughout the month of September. And these are really good opportunities to get those kids hooked by giving them a quality upland bird hunt where things are going to go right instead of, as we know, wrong like they sometimes do. A similar experience is being offered in the Lewiston area by Idaho Fish and Game on October 4th. If you want to find out more, go to the Oregon or Idaho Fish and Game websites and check out the news release pages or the outdoor events calendar page for more information. Other upcoming events include celebrations of the equine variety. Hell's Canyon Mule Days is going on in Enterprise, Oregon this weekend, celebrating all things related to the mule and cowboy culture as well. There's going to be parades, vendors, and so much fun, you're going to find me there enjoying it too. Learn more about it at Hell's Canyon Mule Days 
DraftKingsDaddies.com. And if you're running across me, be sure to say hello. If you would rather see draft horses than mules, make plans to head to the fairgrounds in Deer Lodge, Montana next weekend for the annual Big Sky Draft Horse Expo, where you can see everything from Norwegian Fjord horses to Clydesdales. Find out more about this event at DraftHorseExpo.com. Some people enjoy watching the rodeo, too. If that's the case with you, head to Western Idaho for the annual Lewiston Roundup taking place this weekend. It's recognized as one of the top 50 PRCA rodeos in the country, and it always draws a good crowd. Speaking of crowds and rodeos, the Washington State Fair kicks off this weekend, too, and runs through the 22nd at the fairgrounds. This is always a big, big fair, and a PRCA-sanctioned rodeo is taking place here as well. If you want to do the Puyallup, as they used to say on those quirky TV ads, this is the place for you. That's all for this week. Between horses and fairs and pheasant hunting and fishing derbies, there's a lot going on in the next couple of weeks. If you get a chance, go to our website, northwesternoutdoors.com. You'll find links to find out more about the guests on our show, and you'll also get to hear audio from last week's show, just in case you missed us. Be sure to follow us and like us on Facebook, too, because we're always posting information on our Northwestern Outdoors Radio Facebook page that doesn't necessarily make our broadcast show. Until next time, take care, God bless, get out there and enjoy this wonderful September weather, and make it a point to spend some time outdoors. Outdoors.